Good afternoon, everyone, or morning, if you are on the West Coast. Um, my name is uh, Michelle Booth Olivares, and I am the Communications Associate here at More in Common. Thank you so much for joining us today for a Q&A about our report, Diffusing the History Wars, Finding Common Ground in Teaching America's National Story and Americans' Views on MLK Day. Um, I'm going to give it a few minutes, um, but while I'm doing a bit of context setting and housekeeping, uh, kindly drop your name and organization in the chat as well as where, you, where, where you're at so that we know who is here. Um, a little bit of um, the agenda, we're going to give a quick run through of more in common um, and what we do, and we will go into presentations for both reports today and then take questions at the end. Uh, you can ask your questions in the Q&A portal in the Zoom, which you can find below, um, and commentary or other info you want to share can go in the chat. Historical Society of Princeton. Welcome, Stephanie. We've got folks from South Dakota, New York City, Colorado, Connecticut, Beaumont, Texas. So we're covering all the time zones. Ohio history. Nashville, Maryland, San Antonio. Alaska Historical Society, how fun. Harvard Business School, Cambridge. All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and start. I'm sure we're still going to have a couple people trickle in. Um, oh, we have somebody from Brazil. Uh, Steven speaks Portuguese. He lived in Brazil. So, <laughs> oh. Okay, we'll go ahead and start um, the quick slide. Paul, are you able to share? Thank you. So I'm going to do a quick um, click, quickly click through the next few slides uh, to give a brief summary about more in common and what we do since we have a lot of uh, new attendees registered for this event. But we're excited to have all the new folks here and everyone who's uh, been working with our organization um, throughout the years. If we haven't had the chance to connect with your organization, please reach out via email. Uh, we would love to connect and share more about our work and learn about you. A little bit of history about More in Common. As many of you know, More in Common is a nonpartisan, nonprofit, research and partner centric uh, organization committed to building a more united and inclusive America. Uh, where there's a deep commitment to a shared democratic culture and where all Americans can feel that they belong. We are part of More in Common US, but we are part of a larger international initiative with offices in the UK, Germany, France, and as of a few months ago, Poland. I'm gonna talk about Hidden Tribes. In 2018, we published our most well-known report, Hidden Tribes, which identified seven distinct groups of American public based on their core beliefs. The segmentation methodology enables us to transcend traditional demographic surveys that rely on political affiliation, race, and other demographics, and instead provide deeper under insights about how our values and core beliefs differ across society. The seven tribes are summarized on this slide. We'll make reference to our tribes throughout today's presentation, so I will briefly summarize. The wings are made up of the progressive activists on the left and traditional and devoted conservatives on the right. 
For the wings, tribalism runs deep in their thinking and they have high levels of distrust and fear of the other side. While the wings only make up a third of the population, they often dominate the national conversation, which I'm sure we've all noticed. Um, the exhausted majority makes up the remaining four tribes. While they hold a variety of views, they are united in unique ways. The exhausted majority is fed up with polarization, less ideologically driven, and believe we can find common ground. Like Hidden Tribes, Diffusing the Histon War also gains a lot of traction. Um, it's been featured in the Washington Post, The Atlantic, Education Week, and has been discussed on CNN. And here to talk about that are our lead researchers on the project, Stephen Hawkins and Paula Shinsky. Awesome. Thanks, Michelle. Um, so first, we're just going to share just a little bit about our research methods for this project. Um, so we fielded three large scale quantitative surveys in 2022 in the summer and fall. Um, the first survey was 2,500 US citizens. We then fielded a second 1,500 person survey looking at support for various statements related to American history. And then finally, we refielded many of these same broad statements on views on American history in a third 1,500 person survey. In terms of qualitative research methods, we had an online community of American, uh, Americans representative of the general population last year. We engaged these respondents in activities uh, really similar to focus groups, uh, asking about their views on American history. We used a lot of these quotes in our report and in this presentation to kind of get deeper insights into the often binary questions that we ask in traditional survey research. Uh, we also conducted in-depth interviews with Americans about their views on American history. So first, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the political uh, ecosystem that we currently find ourselves in in America. Uh, and I doubt there's many surprises here, but really most Americans, eight and 10, say that the US really just feels divided. Um, it's held by Americans regardless of their age, of their race, of their party affiliation. But what we see here, and it's a pattern, is that this perception is really higher among Americans who have higher levels of political engagement and less so among those who are less politically engaged, uh, more diverse and also younger Americans. Um, we also gave respondents in our survey about 20 negative and positive words to describe the current moment uh, in America. And Americans really just pick negative words to describe the US today, calling it divided, chaotic, intolerant, racist, rigged, weak and lazy. And again, this was a list of positive and negative words, yet the top 10 words Americans used, all negative. We also gave Americans a list of positive and negative attributes and asked if you know, each of these qualities describe the other side well, be it Democrats or Republicans. And what we found was just really high levels of partisan animosity. So more than seven in 10 Democrats and Republicans alike think the other side is brainwashed, hateful, arrogant. And if you look at this chart here, those lighter red and lighter blue bars, those show the most uh, extreme left and right uh, wings of the hidden tribes. And what we see is that these really extreme ideological groups like progressive activists, devoted conservatives, feel the most partisan animosity towards their partisan counterparts. So getting to the topic of history, we asked about div divisions related to history and uh, similarly, uh, about three in four, 71% of Americans say that we're divided on the topic of US history. Again, what you see here is this perception is really high among those who are politically engaged and extreme, uh, devoted conservatives, progressive activists. Uh, over 90% of each of these groups think that we're divided over US history. Whereas if you look on the far right side of this graph, politically disengaged, younger Americans, Gen Z, millennials, minorities, they don't see as much of this division when it comes to US history. And we've done research in the past on how trust is really low in institutions from the federal government to the media. And our study finds that the education field is really not any different. Most Americans, as you can see here, don't trust education officials to be politically neutral in how they design their curriculum. Only about a, a third of Americans trust American uh, education officials to do this. And similarly, only 41%, so a minority of Americans think that public schools are doing their best to teach American history in an accurate and unbiased way. And what you see here is a little bit of uh, partisan asymmetry. Trust is really higher among Democrats, 56%, whereas if you look at 
you know, those ex more extreme right groups to vote at conservatives, just 9% agree with that statement. So now we'd like to turn to one of the reasons that we think Americans really feel so divided over history. And contrary to public uh, popular opinion, uh, both parties seem to agree on a lot of key principles about how we should teach history. So um, I'm gonna first share some quotes that we got from some of our in-depth interviews that we conducted around the topic of American history. And one of the questions we asked was, you know, what would you say if you could talk to uh, the other side about um, what you think about American history? So the first quote here from Michael, he's a Democrat in Texas. He says, you know, I think media and Republicans think the goal of, of learning American history is to make students feel guilty or ashamed. Whereas I think in general, the idea is more that we want students just to get a real understanding of what happened. Second quote um, comes from Dan, Republican, also from Texas. He says, I want Democrats to know that, you know, I'm not very different when it comes to teaching history than they are. We want to teach what happened, even if that's a disturbing or dark past, you know, I still think we should be teaching that. And these quotes really get at how the average Democrat and Republican often has fairly balanced views towards history that really aren't different from each other. And what I'm going to share here is really a core part of our research uh, in a report that you may have seen, and it's an example of a perception gap. So if you look at that statement on the left, Americans have a responsibility to learn from our past and fix our mistakes. Um, what we did is we asked Republicans in our survey how much they agreed with that statement. So the red dot there is Republican agreement with that statement. The blue dot here is uh, what percentage of Republicans Democrats think would agree with that statement. Yellow dot is what percentage of Republicans independents think would agree with that statement. So here, Democrats and independents are trying to guess or estimate how a Republican would respond and how much they would agree with that statement. And we use this term perception gap to describe this difference between uh, an estimate of a group's views and the actual views of that group. So you can see it there on the right gap percent, uh, which is 58. So what we see here is, you know, 93% of Republicans, an overwhelming majority, think Americans have a responsibility to learn from our past and fix our mistakes, but independents think only about half of Republicans would, and Democrats think even less, only about a third would agree with that statement. What we see is these really large perception gaps on all sorts of issues related to American history. So I'll read the second statement here, Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks should be taught as examples of Americans who fought for equality. 93% of Republicans agree. Democrats think just about a third, 38% of Republicans would agree with that. Next statement, it's important that every American student learn about slavery, Jim Crow and segregation. 83%, most Republicans agree. Democrats think uh, just about a third of Republicans would agree with that. Read one more here. Uh, Throughout our history, Americans have made incredible achievements and ugly errors, really kind of a balanced look at history. Republicans 91% overwhelmingly agree with this, yet Democrats think a minority, just 41% of Republicans would agree with that. Um, so just a few more here. Um, you know, schools should teach both our history of shared natural, his, uh, sorry, shared national history and the history of specific groups such as Black, Hispanic, and Native Americans. Most Republicans, 72% agree. Democrats think just about a third of Republicans agree with that. Um, so what you start to see here is really a pattern of Democrats thinking most Republicans want to focus you know, just on the white majority and overlook um, injustices of the past like slavery and racism. And what we see in our survey is that's really just not the case. And then this is a, a basically the same type of graph, but shows uh, Democrats' actual uh, views and then what Republicans independents think Democrats believe on topics related to US history. So we see a similar pattern of misunderstanding start to appear. I'll read this first statement here. All students should learn about how the Declaration of Independence and Constitution advanced freedom and equality. So an overwhelming majority of Democrats, 92% agree with that statement. Yet Republicans think less than half of Democrats would agree with that. Uh, second one, uh, George Washington and Abraham Lincoln should be admired for their roles in American history. 87% of Democrats agree. 
yet Republicans think 42% of Democrats would agree with that. I'll read one more out here. In learning about American history, students should not be made to see each other as personally responsible for the actions of earlier generations. Most Democrats agree 85%, yet Republicans think just a minority of Democrats, 42% would agree with a statement like that. So just a few more here. Um, this one on the top, the constitution should be preserved and respected. Most Democrats, 80% agree, yet Republicans think just 40% of Democrats would agree with a statement like that. Next one, in learning about American history, students should not need to be made to feel personally responsible for the actions of earlier generations. 83% of Democrats agree, yet Republicans, again, think a minority of Democrats, 43% would agree with that statement. Just one more here, um, teachers should not be allowed to let their political beliefs shape how they teach American history. 83% of Democrats agree, Republicans think just a minority, 43% of Democrats would agree with that statement. So what we see here is that Republicans think Democrats just wanna teach a history defined by shameful oppression and white guilt. And it's just not the case here either. And these perception gaps uh, between each parties uh, present really a dangerous level of misunderstanding. So just a few more slides before I pass off to Stephen. Um, you might be thinking here, well, you know, both Democrats and Republicans are probably just thinking of the extremes on each side, they're estimating or thinking about the views of the extreme right and the extreme left. And what we found is that's really not the case. Um, this graph here shows Republicans' views, again, in dark red, Democrats' estimates in blue, and then devoted conservatives, or most conservative hidden tribe group, their actual views on these statements in light red. And you can see devoted conservatives don't have, uh, they, they show a little bit less support for these statements. But what we see here is that Democrats are not thinking about the views of the extreme right. They're really way off from those views too. They have these imagined enemies in their heads. An example here on the right, you know, 87% of devoted conservatives think MLK Rosa Parks should be taught as examples of Americans who fought for equality. Yet Democrats think just 38% of Republicans would agree with that statement. We did find a place of tension where Democrats are, it, somewhat accurate about the extreme right, that question there at the bottom, does minorities still experience racism today? Uh, just over half of Republicans agree, but what we see here is that only about a quarter of devoted conservatives agree. So that's really close to that democratic estimate. Um, however, Democrats are really just wrong here since they're estimating the views of the average Republican. And this is kind of the reverse of this chart. So it shows Democrats actual views in dark blue the Republicans estimates in red and the actual views of progressive activists. So again, that's our most liberal hidden tribe segment there in light blue. And so that statement on the uh, top, you know, saying 70% of pro progressive activists say in learning about American history, students should not be made to feel personally responsible for the actions of earlier generations. Again, Republicans aren't even close to thinking that that's the views of progressive activists. So we see this similar pattern of Democrats and Republicans thinking that the views of the other side are even more extreme than the most ideologically extreme segments of the population. One more slide here. Uh, in past research, we've done this in the past, uh, perception gap research, and we've seen that Americans often hold inaccurate views of their opponents, particularly those who are on the wings of the hidden tribes and are extremely engaged in uh, media, social media. But we find there on the right that on the subject of how history is taught, perception gaps are larger and more per pervasive. So they're really common across uh, the entire exhausted majority uh, to the wings. So with that, I can pass over to Stephen. Thank you, Paul. So we've seen how there's a lot of misunderstanding, but there's so much conflict around these issues. I wanna get into where we really did find that there are some meaningful differences on important questions related to our history. So first, um, just to show some of the ways that our participants who spoke to us in focus groups or in other qualitative research vocalize this, we hear from the progressive left, for instance, here from Chris, an African-American man from Pennsylvania, saying, we really can't move forward until historical wrongs are acknowledged and mended. 
The harm needs to be fully reckoned with. And this is a great encapsulation of the view on the left. The present is a product of the past. And until we address that past, our present will never really be a fair reflection of how society ought to be. And then on the bottom, we see uh, Manuela, a traditional conservative Hispanic woman, voicing a very different perspective. How long do we have to keep acknowledging the wrongs of slavery before it can be let go? And this is reflecting a view that so much of what happens in present day is not a reflection of history, it's a reflection of our own choices, a reflection of our own cultures, and, and not something which can be attributed to history. And we find this difficult intellectual question can really explain a lot of the differences in viewpoints that we have on questions of history more broadly. So um, here we have a couple other perspectives on how it should, thinking about the history thinking about the past should affect us personally. So we have um, up here a politically disengaged man. So this is Andy, he's not really on the left, not really on the right, somebody who's not particularly involved in politics. But he's saying, when we think about history, it, we shouldn't be left feeling shame because we've learned from our mistakes. We've changed laws. We should admit the errors we've made in the past, but be proud that we fixed them, we've changed laws. Um, and similarly, from a passive liberal, this woman, we're calling Adele, these are some pseudonyms we're using here to protect anonymity, saying we must know where we came from and not forget, but also do better now. And so we also see that there's this sense that uh, it's not a, a rejection of the history, but a sense of responsibility that we have to not continue the mistakes of the past. So here we have a different type of chart. And what we've plotted here are two ideas that are related, one on the x-axis and one on the y-axis. And we ask people to respond to each of these. And they're statements that ask about how we can grapple with our history. So on the y-axis, we have here a statement, the United States needs to more publicly acknowledge the wrongs of earlier generations to be accountable for the harm they've caused. So again, reckoning with the past and acknowledging the wrongdoing that's been done. We see that most Americans agree with that. So that tiny little star there, you can see the middle of your screen shows that more than 50% of Americans agree with that, including more than 50% of white, Hispanic, black, and Asian Americans. And on the Y, on the X axis, sorry, we have um, the statement lingering too much on past atrocities prevents us from moving forward. And then you can see that at the bottom there, that again, more than 50% closer to 75% of Americans agree with that statement too. So these two ideas, which might seem like they're contradictory, one that we need to acknowledge the past more, and the other that there's a risk of us being too focused, too uh, obsessed with the past um, is a real possibility too. They're actually not in tension. Most Americans agree with both of those statements or a majority of Americans agree with at least one of those statements. And so, uh, and we see also that the racial groups, black, Asian, Hispanic, white Americans are rather close together in their view on this. But instead, we have this progressive activist group on the far left at the very top, effectively rejecting the idea that there's any risk of us being too focused on our history and that the only obligation we have is to acknowledge the wrongs of the past. And then you have the far right devoted conservatives group on the bottom corner there saying, the only risk we really need to be, or the only obligation we really have here is to not be too um, focused on and too obsessed with our history. And so you see that really, although this is a conversation about ethnicity and race so much, um, it's primarily a division that falls between ideological poles rather than between racial groups. Okay, and so here we wanted to ask questions also about the teaching of history and what our obligations are there. And on, so on the y-axis here, we are just asking, do you agree that it's important to learn about the history of Americans of different racial backgrounds? And we see that everyone agrees with this, or a majority of all groups agree with this statement. The average agreement is close to 80%. And you can see that more than 75% of all racial groups agree with the statement, devoted conservatives being an outlier here, being closer to 50%. Um, but then we also see that there's about half the population believes that there's a risk today that the history of minority groups is treated as more important than our shared history or shared economic and military and other history, which is our national history as opposed to group specific. And we see that there's a degree of um, sympathy for that viewpoint among black, Asian and Hispanic Americans as well as white Americans. So again, on this tension that we see between 
um, including but not prioritizing anyone's history, we see that again, that's something which is a division primarily between the ideological poles, the overwhelmingly white progressive activist group and the overwhelmingly white devoted conservatives group, and that there's much more commonality among our racial pop, um, across racial populations in getting the balance right between including but not overemphasizing any particular group's history. Okay, and now I wanna just bring us back to where we really are in terms of where there's alignment. So I'm gonna come back to some of the key items that Paul presented before, but first really want to put this in the words of some of the people that we spoke to uh, as part of our research. Um, so here we have a quote from someone who's from Texas, who's a young Republican saying, we must teach these histories, acknowledge them and move forward. Uh, we can't change the past, but we can change the fortress, so future. So again, this idea that um, the, the concern about lingering on the past being really reflected there. Um, and then we have a voice represented from a Black American um, a woman from North Carolina who's a Democrat saying, we should also move on so that no one feels guilty for something they did not do. Again, reflecting that sympathy that there is uh, within our responsibility to acknowledge the past, there is also a risk that it could pass on feelings of guilt or shame um, that aren't appropriate and that it could also lead to us lingering too much on the past and not moving forward. So here, I just want to show an overview of where we really are. So we did the misunderstandings, the big gaps between what people believe the parties believe and what they actually believe. And we showed where there really are differences, but just to kind of come back at a summary view on viewing American history, we can see that these red bars which reflect the views of Republicans, and the blue bars which reflect agreement levels from Democrats, we see really high levels of alignment on core, core principles of American history. Ideas like that America has made incredible achievements and ugly errors, nine out of 10 or more Americans on both sides of the aisle agreeing with that. The idea, for instance, that George Washington and Abraham Lincoln should be admired for their roles in American history, 87% of Democrats agreeing with that, contrary to the view that Democrats only want a critical negative lens on American history. Or for instance, um, you know, skepticism that Republicans believe that uh, the broad uh, skepticism that Republicans believe in broadening equality is contradicted by the statement here that 77% of Republicans saying that America is better today because of progress towards equality. We see so much convergence here in how we understand history, its complexity, its flaws, its excellence, and the goal even of what it is should be that we should be doing with our history, which we get to a little bit more in the next slide. And so here we wanted to, uh, again, just show where we are in terms of how we think we ought to be grappling with the way that we teach the difficult chapters of our history to our students. And we find that there's just so much alignment in terms of principles around teaching history that's neutral, that's inclusive of all groups, that doesn't leave children feeling helpless or disempowered. So look at the second to bottom item here, 87% agreement from Democrats saying, in learning about past injustices in American history and their impact on the present, students should not be made to feel disempowered or helpless. Um, and then again, look at the degree of agreement from Republicans in teaching MLK and Rosa Parks, more than nine out of 10, 83% saying it's important that Americans learn about slavery, Jim Crow and segregation. Just really contradicts what uh, we learned from our qualitative research and what we saw above with Paul's showing of the perception gaps about the caricatured views of what we think it is that Democrats don't wanna teach or Republicans don't wanna teach. And just to sort of make the same points, um, but expanding that analysis beyond just partisan views, really important to look at um, how this extends across racial groups, right? Black, white, Hispanic, Asian, Democrat, Republican, independent, agreeing with the idea that History gives us responsibilities, right? We have a responsibility to learn from the past and fix our mistakes, uncontroversial. Um, the fact that we have a mixed history, not only an exceptional history is uncontroversial. Um, the fact that we don't need to be ashamed to be American is widely held view across the population. Um, and then similarly here, and looking at some of the main characters and some of the main chapters in history, we can see across racial groups, across parties, 
that this alignment in the importance of teaching the negative chapters of history, slavery, Jim Crow, segregation, the alignment in teaching some of the heroic figures that overcame, overcame those chapters, such as MLK um, and so on. We see that there's much less controversy than expected spanning across the crucial groups that make up the public discourse on these issues. Um, but we wanna point out that there's a lot of subtlety to these subjects and it quickly becomes very hard to put some of these uh, uh, places of alignment into action. So on this item, it's important to teach the history of racism in America. Notice how we see Republican support drop from the 83% that said it's important to teach slavery, Jim Crow, and segregation drops down to 52%, right? Because, and, and this is our interpretation, going back to what Paul introduced at the beginning of the call, where trust in public officials to design curricula that don't have agendas is very low and especially low on the right. Trust that um, teachers are not teaching, are teaching a neutral history is very low. And so we see that there's uh, lower support for this teaching history of racism than there is for teaching the specific injustices where um, there might be more trust that it's being done without an agenda. Um, and similarly here, a question of um, teaching history of our own racial backgrounds. We see some of that support drop on the right, although overwhelmingly 73% of Americans agree with this. And then the same on whether it's important for students to learn the history of uh, Americans whose racial backgrounds are different from their own. Eight out of 10 Americans agree with this, and that holds across to majorities of all groups. So I think what I'll do is just spend a few minutes here on some of what the implications are of this. So it's great, it's interesting, but what, what can we do about it and how might your organization or you personally get engaged in addressing these problems? Well, one is that um, as Paul showed with those graphs where we had those yellow V-shape perception gap sizes, and then we looked at today's perception gaps on this specific issue, the perception of an extreme view from the Republican Party or for the Democratic Party is very pervasive. The, the sense of a, a, there's a binary debate happening, it cuts across our whole society. And that's the first step is we need to reject that extreme binary that either you're on team pro-America or either you're on team 1619 project, tear down the American story. Uh, instead, we have to find the nuance that we know that most Americans live in, which is recognizing the incredible achievements and the ugly errors of America's past and finding a story that incorporates and draws on all of that. And we have to trust in our fellow Americans to see that greater complexity, which time and time again, our research revealed to us. We need to cultivate spaces for people to discuss these topics, um, to be candid. The reason we included so many quotes in this presentation is because we know that this is working against people's expectations. The description of how the other party or the other political side views American history is counterintuitive. And one of our uh, tools to counter that perception is to get people connected to each other directly, to have people tell stories and talk to each other and see that the level of um, ideological extremity is much lower than people might expect. And that the degree of commonality that they will find with the other party is often going to be much higher. But we need to create those spaces in education among parents, um, et cetera, in order to allow that insight to come forward. If we're an if you're an organization that works in the education space, we need to find the cross-cutting coalitions that allow Republicans, Democrats, center-right, center-left, independent organizations to push back against this toxic polarization and to empower communities to feel that, they're, that the curricula that's being taught in their schools is a reflection of their values. Fourth, we need to support and lead interventions to reduce these perception gaps. As Paul showed, some of these perception gaps are 40, 50 percentage points large. Um, we're getting it wrong on basic questions of whether the other political party is willing to teach simple facts about our history, whether they're supportive of our constitution. Those are big errors for us to be making about our political counterparts. And so interventions that can help close that gap might help bring down some of the anxiety and allow for constructive dialogue to move forward. And a lot of work is being done in the depolarization space, 
um, perhaps by some of the people on this call to find ways of reducing those perception gaps. And the early evidence shows that it's possible to do so. It's possible to bring down people's level of affective polarization in an, an intervention that's as short as two or three minutes. And finally, challenge zero sum thinking. This idea that if some, if, uh, um, some group is getting more attention, it's coming at the expense of another group and that um, we can't cede any ground is unhelpful in a conversation that should be about learning and growth and identity. So I look forward to your questions. I'm now going to turn it over to my colleague, Coco. Thank you, Stephen. I know we're all eager to jump into the, uh, the Q&A session with all these interesting findings. So I'll just be really quick uh, sharing our most recent report on the MLK Day. For this report, we surveyed 1,000 Americans and found that our misperceptions of each other that Stephen and Paul just talked about have actually also extended to our holidays that we celebrate. In reality, we actually hold much common ground when it comes to Dr. King and the holiday that honors his legacy. First, we found that many Democrats significantly underestimate the importance Republicans place on MLK Day. If we look at the blue dot here, which is Democrats' estimate of Republicans' views, we can see that Democrats think only 38% or less than 4 in 10 Republicans agree that it is important to observe MLK Day. However, if we look at the red dot, which is Republicans' actual views, over 7 in 10 Republicans recognize the importance of this holiday. On the flip side, Republicans significantly underestimate Democrats' willingness to recognize improvements in racial equality. If we look at the red dot here, Republicans think only 45% of Democrats agree that racial equality has improved significantly since the time of Dr. King. But in reality, 71% of Democrats acknowledge improvements in racial equality. So contrary to these misperceptions, our research indicates that we actually share common ground when it comes to MLK Day. 84% of Americans, which is an overwhelming majority, agree that it is important to celebrate MLK Day. And this holds true, as you can see in this graph, across political affiliation, race, and generation. Most Americans also agree that racial equality has improved significantly since the time of Dr. King in the 60s, including 71% of Democrats and 60% of Black Americans. Beyond our agreement on MLK Day, Americans also share a really deep sense of respect for Dr. King. When asked to describe Dr. King, most Americans use the words leader, brave, and activist to describe him. There are interesting variations by generation, which we can explore in the Q&A session. But with that, I want to close our presentation and really echo the recommendations Stephen just shared earlier. The perception gaps that we have for each other, no matter if it's on American history or on our holidays, often make us believe that our views are so drastically different from each other that when we can't even have a conversation or a dialogue. So it is really essential for us to assume greater complexity in the beliefs of Americans and also to create more spaces for us to come together and de discuss these topics and have actual productive dialogue on what we disagree on. So with that, thank you so much. I'll pass it over to Michelle. Thank you so much, Stephen, Paul, and Coco. With that, we're gonna take questions. Uh, please post your questions in the Q&A that you can see down below on your screen. Commentary goes in the chat. If we don't get to your questions, um, we can follow up. Please shoot us an email. We wanna to get to as many questions as possible. I'll have a colleague post our emails in the chat so that you can reach out to us after. Uh, so the first question, um, it says, maybe you said this at the beginning, which I missed, but it would be interesting to know how many people on the Zoom webinar today. <laughs> oh, yes, it gives us a sense of connectedness. I'm sorry. So, yeah, so there's, uh, we have 70, well, we had um, 
we have 72 now and up to 76 people. Um, and as you heard um, earlier, people from multiple organizations, historic societies, uh, civic building spaces, education associations, um, educators. So we have a really good group of, of people here um, that we're hopeful can take this information and um, apply it uh, with your groups or your networks. Um, so Alan's questions is, um, how much has been studied on the amount of money spent by anti-public education billionaires to disrupt the process of public education, their goal being the same as it's been for more than four decades, privatize all education via vouchers, charters, and so-called choice schools. In accomplishing this, state taxes paying for public education are reduced and the for-profit education takes the lead. All they need to do is make the public distrust the institution. Um, I can jump in on can that. Can you answer that, Stephen? Thank you. Yeah, um, it's a really fair question because we know that there are a lot of opportunists that are taking advantage of the conflict around education. Um, it's good for fundraising if you're a candidate. It's good for um, campaigning in election season. It makes for good cable news. Um, and so there's a lot to be gained from inflaming this conflict. And it's also quite hard for us to determine the degree of validity in the conflict because there's not a single national curriculum. And so it's very difficult for us to know the degree to which certain ideas are being taught. Um, but I would push back on the idea that the reason um, that there's low trust in education is primarily because of these bad actors or these actors that are trying to defund public education. And the reason I push back on that is because we see that trust in national institutions is low regardless of where they are. Federal institutions are distrusted. Uh, large and multinational corporations are distrusted. We see that as you get more local, people's trust increases, uh, whether that's in the media or whether that's in um, local uh, government officials. And this is something we explored extensively in our two stories of distrust report. And so I think we're, we're dealing with a much bigger problem than just the activism of billionaires here where distrust is really a feature of our broader society today. Thank you, Steve. Um, the next question uh, from Carl, you identified a couple areas of real difference. It seems that the topic areas used to quantify the gaps as modest avoided those really hot button issues such as LGBTQ and religious history, which appear to inflame public discussions and override the areas of agreement. Can you talk about that? Sure, I'll jump in on that one too. Um, one is that we have looked uh, somewhat at questions around teaching of gender identity, teaching of LGBTQ concepts. And there's a, there is a lot more division there. Um, so around the, the, the teaching of American history and, and teaching of, of uh, racial identity is far, there's far more common ground there than we saw on other issues. So we're, we don't want to give the impression that there aren't areas of disagreement between Republicans and Democrats, including on school policy. But in this area of American history, we find so much common ground that's not seen. And I'm going to combine two questions. Um, uh, one question is, did you aggregate any data from Asian Americans? And another question says, were recent immigrants a group that was surveyed at all? I missed whether or not they were included in those graphs. I'm happy to keep going unless Coco or Paul, you want to jump in. Um, Coco? <laughs> I can jump in on the MLK Day survey. I think this is directed on that. So for the um, just for the surveys on the history perception gaps, diffusing the history war, we did aggregate data from Asian Americans, and I believe our graphs have shown that. But for the MLK Day survey, we survey 1,000 Americans who are representative across generation and race. But because Asian Americans are 6% of the total US population, it means that out of the 1,000 Americans we surveyed, there were only 60 Asian Americans. And we feel that it's just not a big enough sample size for us to report confidently out on. But in the future, we do plan to have oversample of Asian Americans so we can confidently uh, report out these findings. And in terms of immigrants, yes, uh, in our survey, we did ask if people were born in the US or they were naturalized citizens. So yes, we have data on recent immigrants as well. Thank you. Um, from Alicia, in more recent intergroup contact research, we're seeing more difficulties of getting people on the extremes to come to the table and to have movement and attitudes and views because of polarization and perception gaps. How do you think your findings can be applied 
uh, to get past this extra barrier for those with more extreme views. So an intervention that we have seen that's effective is um, simply sharing this data, especially sharing data um, together with people's personal stories. Um, Morin Kam is going to be doing research in the next four to six weeks here that's going to be testing how to methodologically develop those videos so that they're the most persuasive. For instance, it might be the case that including people who um, the viewer of the video can relate to absorbing information about the out group in a way that changes their mind or is persuasive to them might be the most effective way to do that. So we're currently testing that. Um, I would also direct you um, to the uh, Strengthening Democracy Challenge, which is uh, hosted at Stanford and led by Rob Willer, where they have done a lot of work, including a mega study where they evaluated something like 25 or more types of interventions to reduce partisan animosity and increase trust and found that most of them were effective to a statistically significant degree. So I would encourage you to uh, look at Strengthening Democracy Challenge because there's a, a range of different types of interventions, all of them only a few minutes long, that can help move towards that practical goal of bringing people into conversation better. Thank you. I'm gonna combine a question I'm seeing in the chat and then one in the questions. Reminder, if you want a question, please put it in the Q&A. Uh, somebody said, are there slide sets or materials available from your research uh, to share in this community? And somebody said, will this be posted? So we will be posting this, um, this video uh, of the webinar online later. And on the website is you can download the report, the graphics, and I'll be sharing that at the end. Um, so another question, how many of us might agree that part of the reason for perception gaps are due to the fear of people to honestly express their two feelings without being maligned for having some agreement with the other side? And did we see any of that when we talked to people? Oh, Coco, Coco do you want to take I guess I would say we do know that there is a lot of concern about people expressing their their views on these issues. These are really difficult topics. Um, at least 80% of Americans think that political correctness is a problem to some degree in the United States. Uh, we know that it's a problem which skews more to the right. People on the far left don't tend to see idea policing or language policing as, as big of a concern, but even about 50% of people who are strongly liberal see that as an issue too. So there's no denying that talking about these issues is tricky. It's, uh, it brings out a lot of anxiety. And so it just comes back to one of our recommendations at the end is that organizations that have reach, that have memberships that are cross-cutting across parents, businesses, schools, et cetera, uh, can be intentionally creating spaces where people feel invited and encouraged and trusted to express their views on these issues because we know that's addressing a need that people have and that, it will, and that there's a lot of anxiety that's keeping people from doing so as we speak. Thank you. Um, has any work been done to assess students' views on American history to see the effects of school's history's lessons? Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, I was just going to say we haven't done any specific polling on this. Uh, we don't typically pull on, on people under 18, but um, I know that at least some of the polls that I've seen from teachers that uh, they're definitely dealing with these issues. Um, and there's really strong feelings of divisions um, lingering from COVID, but also uh, political issues. But over to you, Stephen. Uh, no, I, I agree with that, Paul. And just to say that it's a real challenge to know what to attribute people's views of American history to, because they are in school and they're getting information that way, but they're also in the culture and they're getting information from film and TV and from social media and from friends. And so disag disaggregating those different sources of information and knowing what to attribute outcomes to is a complicated problem. Um, but very worthwhile because we do see that there's a lot of differences across generations in terms of attachment to the United States and pride in the United States. And it's going to continue to be a live conversation for decades to come because of those big differences. And Carolyn in the comments said that um, her organization um, has had two focus groups with students and they felt their teachers are the most trustworthy people in their lives followed by parents. 
Um, please, any research, please put in the chat, um, since we have people in all kinds of spaces that might have some more insight into some of these questions. A uh, question from John, does the breakdown in perception really revolve around the idea of whether or not historical understandings should shape action policy decisions today? That is, conservatives seem comfortable honoring MLK and Rosa Parks as great leaders who changed America, but much less comfortable seeing that MLK and Parks ideas are still relevant today. Isn't learning about the past different than learning about and actively using that knowledge. And that's that's a big, big question, right? Because <laughs> that's really at the heart of it is the degree to which um, the present, the pat, uh, the degree to which history is alive today in shaping outcomes is a big part of the disagreement. Um, and there's not a single answer to that, right? Some people's stories and families are heavily impacted by the past, and some people's families and stories are uh, affected by more recent events and uh, recent immigrants. And so uh, it's, there's not a single answer about the degree to which uh, economic or educational or family or social outcomes are the result of history today. And so that it, it's, a, it's a very worthy conversation to talk about the degree to which the past is affecting the present. And um, uh, through our recommendations, we're hoping that other organizations will bring forward this conversation into communities where it can be had in a context of trust, because there's not a short answer to it, and there needs to be a space for people to disagree healthily about it. Thank you. I think um, in, I remember speaking to somebody recently, Stephen, help me out, but who said something about compartmentalizing the different factions of this from like history, today. Um, I forget what that person had said, but it it resonated very well. Um, but that's kind of, you know, we're seeing like, there's one thing to talk about the history, it's another thing to talk about how uh, these issues apply today. Um, do you think partisan diversity? Uh, oh, go ahead, Coco. Sorry, just also wanted to jump in on that question. I think we would agree that perhaps learning about the past is also learning about how to actively use that language on the present. But one thing to note is that we do have different interpretations of the past. Like for example, in the MLK Day survey, we found out that there's a really wide generational divide when it comes to how people interpret who Dr. King was. For example, Gen Z Americans were much more likely to describe him as a revolutionary versus older Americans are more likely to describe him as a Christian or an advocate for um, racial colorblind ideology. So how we interpret the past, I think would also means that we have different lessons on what it means uh, for the present. But it, what it, what's really important is that we have spaces to at least engage with these histories and have productive conversation and debate. Thank you, Coco. I'm gonna move up to a question I, I skipped. Can you speak more about the most effective efforts you've seen to reduce the perception gap? Yeah, so um, one of the most effective ones might be something that a lot of people on this call have actually already seen, which is an advertisement by Heineken called Worlds Apart. And what it features are a, it's a series of advertisements where strangers are assigned a task, and this is all on video, where they have to solve a problem together and they have to build something together. They don't know each other and they're working together. And then at a crucial moment when they've completed their task, the fact that they are on very different sides of a political issue is suddenly revealed to them. One person's a transgender, the other person doesn't support transgender people. One person's a climate activist, the other person doesn't believe in climate change. And in the advertisements, it shows, and these are real people, not actors, um, that they decide to preserve the relationship that they've been building um, rather than uh, retrench into their political camps. Um, and even though this was set in the UK and the issues aren't exactly the same as the United States, that advertisement was shown to reduce affective polarization, increase um, people's willingness to work together. Um, and, you know, those sorts of interventions, which uh, cultivate a relationship that's not based on politics, but based on cooperation and seeing humanity in each other seem to be very effective. Um, and there's a lot of appetite, I think, in funder communities and philanthropy to get behind advancing those sorts of interventions, both in person and in terms of media. Um, I don't know, Paul or Coco, if either of you want to mention any others, um, 
but uh, one of the others that's effective is showing these perception gaps as well. Um, and our partners over at and our colleagues over at Beyond Conflict have also been working on these types of interventions and shown their efficacy. Thank you, Stephen. This question from um, Eugenia and Eugenia. Uh, do you think partisan diversity or the lack of it in social network composition contributed to your findings? Was data collected on respondents' social networks at all? Thanks again for these interesting findings. I'm happy to jump in here real quick. So we did um, ask specific questions related to you know, how often do folks talk to people from other sides of the political aisle? How many friends do they have from the other side of the political aisle? And we really didn't see a relationship here in, you know, specific perception gaps related to history. Um, we've done research on this in the past in perception gaps in 2019. And, you know, what we found, and these were uh, questions on sort of like broad issue items like immigration, policing, and we saw that, you know, the more extreme hidden tribe groups, so people on the far right, far left, were really bad at estimating uh, the real views of the other side. But what we saw in history is that we just didn't really see a correlation here um, in terms of ideology, you know, how much people speak to the other side. Everyone really had high perception gaps. And some of the reasons we still need to do more research on this is that perhaps on this issue area, folks just don't know the views of the other side on history. Um, there's another chance that, you know, perhaps perception gaps have gotten worse over the past few years. So really more research is need, needed to be done, but Stephen Coco, feel free to jump in. And um, this question from Ben, um, thank you, uh, very helpful, informative. His question, there's a Delta poll that surveyed uh, over a thousand um, 18 to 20 year olds and found the respondents to these percentages recall being taught the following in schools, 45% of, of America is built on stolen land, 41% America white people have white privilege, 36% America is system, systemically racist country. This is more than a third of young adults reporting they believe they were taught at least some elements of critical race theory in school. How do these perceptions of what young adults believe they were taught in school impact trust in education? and perceptions that we are teaching history in a way that is neutral and inclusive of all groups. So one challenge with all of this work is that the definition of critical race theory and critical theory generally is really nebulous and debated and hotly contested, as is the definition of racism, in fact, and the concept of racism and systemic racism is one that's not, doesn't have alignment and agreement across political groups. So that's part of what's made this work so challenging is, to, you know, you, you're mentioning some, some ideas there, the fact the United States was built on stolen land, for instance, you know, is that part of a broader curriculum that also teaches students that they need to perceive themselves as belonging to a historical racial, racial group and that there's debts that belong there, et cetera? Um, I, we don't know. Um, so I think one of the things you're illustrating there is how hard it is for us to actually have these conversations due to the lack of clarity around the terminology um, and, and the lack of, and, and there's also been an intentional effort by some to pin every bad idea that they have ever found onto this concept of critical race theory. Um, the impact of this, that that is having on people's trust in education, I would go back to my earlier answer, which is that it looks like trust in educational institutions broadly is something which is on the decline, independently of the events of the last two years, as is trust in institutions more generally. Um, I don't think it's helping. I think it's, it, it's exacerbating the lower trust that we're seeing on the conservative right. Um, and so I think it's all the more reason that it's an urgent task for us to start connecting communities so they can have the conversations about the quality of the curriculum and the ideas within it. Thank you. And oh, go ahead, Coco. Yeah, and I also like to add and echo what Stephen shared earlier. In general, it's very difficult for survey respondents to attribute their sources of knowledge or like attribute what they've learned to the actual sources of knowledge. Did they learn about a concept from school or was it from social media or from family and friends? It's very hard for anyone to tell. And also when in the survey question, when you directly ask a survey respondent, did you learn about XYZ concept? Yes or no. A lot of times people tend to answer yes because sometimes it's somewhat leading. 
So I think we need to really complicate our understandings when it comes to what's actually being taught in school, like what Stephen just talked about. Thank you. And last question. And afterwards, I'm going to do a quick um, guide of our website that has a lot of the tools and resources that everybody can use. The last question. I'm curious for future research as to how often those polled interact with others different from themselves. So here, I think I would probably direct you to work by Dan Cox at the American Enterprise Institute, who I think has done the best work on sort of network and uh, diversity and diversity of networks. Um, we have collected in the past some of these data, including in our original Hidden Tribes survey, um, but I don't think we can speak to that for, on this specific subject, um, but certainly a question worthy of further analysis. Thank you. And I'm going to share our website. Um, historyperceptiongap.us. This is our website. You can download the report here. Um, but we have a perception gap quiz that we encourage everyone to take. Take it with your friends and colleagues so that you can compare your data and see where, where you land. Um, we have videos. Um, this is the entire report here. Um, we also have uh, perspectives from Americans. So you can, a lot of what you saw in the report and the presentations, we made videos, um, fun videos that you can share on social media, as well as quoting and the voice, um, you know, the audio recording of people uh, sharing their perspectives. Um, these are people, Americans' voices, the resources, all of, we've created a couple of graphics for people if you wanna share those. And again, here's the quiz. Here's a quick video that we made explaining the history perception gap and a quick a minute 30 of our of this entire presentation. Can you believe that we packed it in <laughs> in 90 seconds um, and all the charts in the report are all here for you to download um, and use with your groups and your networks. Um, and then you can also see all of the coverage of of the report here on our website. Um, so we encourage you to go onto the website and see what materials help you and your networks to share this message, how you can have this conversation yourself. Um, and more importantly, thank you so much to everybody for um, attending our webinar, um, to our panelists as well. Um, our information is on the right. Uh, please reach out to us if you have more questions, if you wanna partner with us, um, any anything you want to share with us. So we hope to see you again at, the next webinar or in these spaces and hope that we found uh, new friends of more in common through this uh, who are new in our network. Thank you again. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, everyone.